Well, tonight, we're going to be talking about the network church. And my key scripture, in, as his, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And we know that the sound of his voice means, uh, back then, you know, there weren't things that were loud like they are these days. But many waters is apparently very, very loud and very, very powerful. But I think there's also a prophetic picture here in the, of his voice coming from many waters, many peoples. And this is a picture, I think, of the last day's church. And I'm looking at it, and you can say these are individual people. And they have different colors that they, they used here, which could be, they could be different races. They could be different denominations. They could be a lot of different things. But God is bringing his body together. And he's doing it himself. But I, the question is, how, what's this going to look like? So we're going to do a little study of that today. Talk about what at least the Lord has shown me about that. And I want to start here in Revelation. Because I believe this is a picture of the last day's church. And this is where the scripture comes from out of Revelation uh, 1, 13 through 16. And in the middle of the lampstands, and some translations say, and among the lampstands, one like the Son of Man clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. So here's a picture of Jesus among the lampstands, among his church, among his body. So in these last days, he's saying, I'm going to come down. I'm going to be among my people. And then he says, and his head and his hair were white like wool and like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze. That's a serious look. That, that has a power of truth and judgment. You just get the feeling that with those flames, of, of, uh, flames uh, in his eyes, that as he looks on things, they'll just go poof, and whatever remains is going to be uh, gold and precious stones and silver. But the rest will burn up. And, of course, bronze usually is a, a, a judgment. And he continues on. He says, when it is uh, the burnished bronze, when it has been uh, caused to glow in the furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. I believe in these last days, before he comes back, his voice is going out. And it will be from many, many places. And it's not going to be just the lone prophet over here crying in the wilderness. I think that's the way it was last time. I don't think that's what we're going to see this time. I think we're going to see the body of Christ crying out. And the word will come forth in many, many places. And they're not going to be able to stop it. And in his right hand, he held the seven stars. Now, these are the seven messengers for the seven letters. But basically, it's the last day's message. He's got it in his right hand, the, the, the hand of power. And he's holding this last day's message. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And we don't have to tell you what that is. That's the word. It's coming out of his mouth. The word that can cut and divide and decide, this is of me and this isn't. So this is the church. And this is what we're going to look like in the last days. And his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. There's a brightness. That's, the, what, they, that's what the lampstands are supposed to have on them. A bright light. So I believe this is a picture of the last day's church. So <clears throat> I had a picture here of the last day's church. This is the bride. But which one it is? Which one do you think it is? Is it the, is it the soldier who's ready for battle? Or is it the bride who's ready for her groom? Which do you think it is? Both. Can you be both in these days? Can you be prepared and skilled, ready to stand against the enemy, and yet at the same time be ready in your heart? Can, one is like an, the external battle and the other is like the internal battle. Can we be ready on both fronts? I believe that's what we're going to look like in the last days. Because he's coming for a bride, a victorious bride. So how do we know there's going to be some struggles in the last days? Well, he tells us in, in Revelation 3.21. To he who overcomes. Now, notice it says to he who overcomes. That's really important because remember the letters are to the churches. But the overcome isn't to the church. It's to the individual. 
to he who overcomes, to the individual who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. Now, what do you think that means? Who sits with the king on his throne? The queen? Yes, the queen. So that's what he's talking about here. To he who overcomes, you will be the bride. I'm not convinced that's going to be everybody in these last days. Because he says it. He says, as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he built a model and a way for us. And he says, I've made a way for you to come and join me on my throne. But you must overcome as I overcame. So this is the bride. Now, let me ask you, is the queen a governmental position? Yes. She's not just uh, someone who, like a first lady here. A queen is literally a governmental position. And that's what we are. We're to rule and reign on the throne with Christ. Those who are going to be his bride. And then he says in Revelation 12, he says, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, the victory at the cross. And because of the word of their testimony, and you shall receive power to be my witness to give testimony and did not love their life even unto the death. Now, I believe that both deaths, the soldier, maybe even the physical death, but the bride, maybe the death of the flesh. But in either case, can you see that this is going to be an incredible time to be alive? And I don't want to miss it. I want to be ready for this. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at Isaiah to understand a little bit more of what's happening here. Isaiah 9 for a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Okay, what is his shoulders? What part of the body is he? He's the head. So what do you think we might be? The shoulders and the body. So the government will rest even on us. Yes, he's the head, but we will rule and reign with him. So the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. So what do you think that means? Does that mean that he's a socialist and he just keeps getting a bigger government? No, it means that what he's going to reign over is going to continue to grow. Of the increase of what we're going to govern over, it's going to increase and grow. But how can that be? Because God already is over everything. How could it increase? Yes. Well, how about the fact that he's a creator? You see, I believe right now we're in a time where God says, I want someone to share my eternal life with, someone to have and to hold, to love and to cherish. Now, does a man get married at the end of his life? When does he get married? Why? Why does he get married at the beginning of his life? What does he want? To spend his life with his bride. That's right. Someone to share his life with. So I don't believe that it's going to be the end. I don't believe we're going, getting anywhere near the end. I think we're getting near the beginning. But he's looking for a bride. So what he wants to do is he's going to come back for that bride and he wants to get married. And that's when things really get started. That's when he's starting his life. But he needs someone to rule and reign to share this by his side. And how can he increase? Have you seen the universe lately? It's getting bigger every day. It's pretty big, isn't it? So what do we know about the universe? It looks pretty empty, doesn't it? But God had no problem creating on the earth just a beautiful garden. It probably looks, a, the earth, I believe, looks a whole lot more like heaven than it does all the other planets, don't you think? But I believe he's going to populate those. I believe it's like a, a man standing with his arm over his bride saying, you know, over here we'll put the barn. Over here we'll grow our garden. Can you see what he's doing? He's laying this thing out. So we're about to come to the beginning. But I believe that God is only, that Jesus Christ is only going to be married one time. What do you think? Do you think he's going to get married multiple times? No, I think he's going to get married once. And I believe that once he does, that's the bride. And that's the beginning of it all. I don't think he's going to get married again. And I don't think the bride's going to actually grow. I think we're going to be it. I think what, that's what we're going through right now. We're in that time. 
where he's creating a bride so he can get married. And when does that happen, by the way? Does it happen at the end of time? No, it happens when he returns, right? Maybe a little before he returns. It's going to happen real soon. So this is, the, this is the most important moment in history. They'll be talking about this for eternity. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. And on the throne of David over his kingdom, the throne of David is here. It's on the earth. But it's ruling over all creation. To establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish that. <clears throat> I guess that's the youth. It must be the, the millennials. That's the zeal of the Lord, I guess. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. So let's look a little further in Isaiah. And I want to make just a little point here because this is a point that I'm going to use as we go forward. Isaiah in 46, he said, I make known the end from the beginning. From the ancient times, what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. You see, God had a purpose and he declared it from the very beginning so that we would know what it is. And I believe that we can look at the beginning of the Bible and we can find out what that purpose is and know that if he declared it, it's going to come about because his purpose will stand. And I believe his purpose is clear. He's looking for a bride. Because didn't the Bible start with a wedding? Isn't it going to end with a wedding? Did he declare the end from the beginning? Yes. The two shall be as one. That whole purpose was just so that we could be by his side to be joined with him. He didn't have to create all this this way. But I believe that's what he created us for. But there's another side to this. So I believe the bride is, is kingdom government. However, there's something else that happened at the beginning that's going to happen again at the end. Babylon. Yes, it happened in the beginning and it will come back in the end. And this is very important to know because this is not God's government. This is world government. This is man's government. So if we look at Babylon, it'll give us a couple of clues here. Now, the whole earth had one language and a common speech. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. So there was the plan. And notice that in this situation that he's building a tower. So the people got together to build a tower. Now, why would they have built a tower? Yeah, they, they built the tower because it's to fulfill a prophecy. The prophecy of the devil. What did the devil say? I will exalt my throne above the heavens and above the clouds. So he was getting mankind to build him a throne. And as soon as mankind built it, he was going to step in on top of it and rule and reign over the earth. But God saw what was going on, right? So the Lord came down and saw this thing. And the Lord said, behold... They are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Do you see a principle here? That if, do you see why the, the world is so afraid of the church coming together? If we could come together as one, can you imagine what can happen here? We look at the power in an individual. But when we get assembled into a temple, there's a whole other feeling that's going to take place. A tremendous power. It says right there that nothing will be impossible. So what did he do? Well, he confused their language. Remember, the whole world had one language and common speech. But what's going to happen in the last days? What's happening now? Can you see it? Isn't the world coming back together as one? Hasn't the internet done that? Yeah. Can't you see how this is all coming together? So what do you think mankind's going to do? They're going to restart building the tower, aren't they? Only this time, God's not going to stop them. Because we know that the devil is going to come down and sit on top of that as the Antichrist and rule and reign from it, don't we? But that's one side of it. There's another side, and that's us. 
Now the whole world had the one language. And they said, let us build a city that we may make a name for ourselves. The false bride is pride. We want to make a name for ourselves. But when God frustrated that, he came up with his own plan. So he then went and got Abraham and he said, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. You don't have to do it. I will do it. So there's the two right there. There's a picture of the two. And this is how we can tell in the last days because as the, as the bride comes together, the false church is going to come together too. And the world is going to come together. There's going to be a lot of coming together. And how are you going to sort out what's the real and what's not? Well, I guarantee, even if it looks like something godly, if we're doing it to make a name for ourselves, I think you're building the Tower of Babel. You just don't know it. We need to let God, He wants to make your name great. That's the true bride. So we're going to talk about how that's going to be done. The false bride, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, in one of the seven angels, this is in Revelation 17, who had the bowls came and spoke, come here and I will show you the judgment on the great harlot who sits on the many waters. So you remember he had a voice of many waters. Now the harlot sits on many waters. So what are the waters we're talking about here? The waters which you saw were the peoples, the multitudes, the nations, and tongues. So when I say a voice of many waters, the interpretation is that his voice will be the voice of many peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues all together as one. Now, how is that going to happen? Is it happening now? If you just look at the, the denominations and all the things that's going on in the world, do you see a problem here? So far, it doesn't look good. But I believe God is building his church. And of course, he warns us. When you, when you see something that's happening, that's being done for the name of man, he said, it's a Babylon, come out of her, my people, because it's an adultery. So there's two brides here, the real one and the false one. The network church. So let's look at the network church. So what do we mean by a network? Well, here's a simple definition. A network is a group or a system of interconnected people or things. Sounds simple enough. There's lots of versions of a network. So let's look at a couple of models. The internet. The internet's new. What, 30, 40 years old, roughly? So why do you think it came about? Could it possibly be fulfilling the purposes of God? Can you see what's happening here? This is reversing what happened in the Tower of Babel, isn't it? Because now the languages and barriers are not there anymore. Everything's coming together as one. So right now we know the Tower of Babel is going to be rebuilt because that's what mankind's going to do. But we also know that it's an opportunity for us to understand how do we come together. And I believe a network is going to be the model of the last day's church. So the internet is a model and we'll talk about the model. But there's a couple other models. The cell phone network. It's another model of a network. You know, you can take your cell phone and talk to somebody in Africa. But you're really not talking to somebody in Africa. What you're doing is your voice is being changed and the network is carrying it in a different form all the way to Africa and translating it back to a voice. Now that would have seemed like magic a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. But God has allowed all these technologies to come forth because we're moving toward this end. And I believe God has the perfect plan for the end. And it is going to happen. These things are going to come back together. But it's important that we understand how to come together also. And to me, the most exciting network is this. It's a body. You see, there's different types of ways that things get organized. And it seems like the church has chosen a hierarchical method, right? But is that the way he said his organization is supposed to look? Is it supposed to look like an organization or an organism? He calls it a body because it's supposed to look like a body. See, in a body, does the finger report to the hand, which reports to the arm, which reports to the shoulder, and then to the head? Is it hierarchical? No. What controls this finger? 
Is it the hand? Totally the brain, right? See, the brain controls everything in this body. So a body isn't hierarchical. It's all controlled by the one head. And I believe that he wants us to be a body. Not a hierarchical structure, but everybody's supposed to be connected. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, I think this is the way he did it. Number one, he's the brain. He's the head of the body. But I believe the Holy Spirit is the nervous system of the body. It connects every single cell in the church directly to the brain. And that is the key to the last day's church. That everyone must be directly connected to the brain for the body to function. So if you're in leadership, your goal is to not to get in the way between the finger and the head. It's to do everything you can to get this finger to talk directly to the head. And then let God decide. Because if I close my hand, that's not my hand making that decision. All those choices are being made right up here in the brain. But do we actually believe that if we connect everybody to the head, that Jesus Christ himself will be able to control that body? Do you believe that? Well, I, then how's this structure going to look? Well, I believe it's going to be a network. And when I say a network, I don't believe that means pastors are going to network together. That's not what they're talking about. I'm talking about if you're a part of the body of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is upon you, he's on you because he has called you to Isaiah 61, right? It says the, Holy, the Spirit is upon me because he has anointed me too. So if that's the case, if he's put his spirit upon you, then you are a part of that body and you should be directly connected to the head. And so as leadership, the goal that we would have is to get everybody connected directly to the head so that God, the, the Jesus Christ, can control his own body. And I believe that this is a network. And I don't believe it's a bunch of pastors getting together. I believe it's everybody in the Christ, everybody in the body of Christ is supposed to start reaching out and connecting to other parts of the body. And I believe everybody should be doing that. I, you, the local church is fine. You can have your local church and local groups. You can have many of them. But the point is, you need to get out there on your own and begin to make your connections across the body. Because that becomes the network. So let's look at a network. If we look at the physical network, like the internet, it establishes a means of direct peer-to-peer -peer communication to all its members. So if I write an email, I can write, I don't have to go through a hierarchical structure to write an email to somebody, right? I can email Mary or I can text her directly, one to one, and virtually anybody in the world. You see, the, net, the, the internet isn't a business, it didn't, but it changed the world. Small businesses all of a sudden could become big because now they could reach everybody. Do you see that that's a model? That the Lord is showing us clearly that that's what the church needs to be. Peer to peer. Peer means the same. We're even. So we're all even in the body of Christ. We're all directly connected to the head, not hierarchical. So we need to be able to build a network that establishes peer to peer. Can handle one to many or many to one communications. That means... We think of everything as one to many, right? We're preaching to a whole bunch of people. But that's not the way we minister here. We get a bunch of ministers and we'll surround one person that needs ministry. Because we believe that you not only can do one to many, but you can do many to one. Of course, you send out emails to a bunch of people and they'll send them all back and then you'll find out what many to one is. But a network should be able to do that. You should be able to talk to many and receive from many. It allows members to... Um, Act autonomously. What that means is, if you've got a network, and you've got different computers on the network, each one of those computers can be doing its own thing. But they're sharing information and they're working together. They're collaborating. That's not the way it used to be in the beginning. In the beginning, they had big mainframes, and everybody was a slave to the mainframe. Sounds like your basic church model. In lots of, <laughs> um, well, there are churches like that. But you see, he's saying, no, everyone's autonomous. Even the body has, each body has an, an, an autonomic nervous system. I mean, the heart keeps beating, the lungs keep working. I believe that we're to operate autonomously, meaning under direct control of the Holy Spirit, we should be able to do, every single person should be able to operate independently.
But we're going to work together because we're being coordinated by the same head. Uses a common set of values. What I mean by that, if you look at the internet, the reason that you can talk to other people is that there's an agreed upon protocol that allows the communication to take place. And so you have to have a common set of values that allow these assumptions so that you can communicate directly. So we, as the body of Christ, need to decide what is that common set of values. Is it the um, Methodist Book of Resolutions, which is about this thick? I mean, what do you think that common set of values is? The what? The Bible. Absolutely. So we have a foundation here. We don't need the church doctrine as much. What we need is the biblical doctrine. We need to say this is the same word. I got to ask you, is, uh, in this group right here, when's the last time you remember actually talking about church doctrine as opposed to what the Bible says? You know, when I was first saved, almost all discussions were about church doctrine. You go to a, a church, and that's what, they're, that's what they're talking about. Well, this is what this is, and this is what this is, and this is what this is. I saw a friend from seminary, and he comes in, and he's got this book this thick. And I said, what's that? He said, that's what we're studying in seminary. What is it? He said, it's the Methodist Book of Resolutions. And it's four times as thick as the Bible. Wow. Saying, we missed something here. So I believe our network is not based upon the church doctrine. It's based upon the Word of God. And I believe, as you found... Do you see how much common is starting to happen now? God is building His church. If we can release all this stuff and just see what the Word says, it's going to be amazing. Amen. Can handle diversity of components and people. See, if you're on a, a network, uh, it can be an Apple, it can be a PC. All those different machines can talk on the same Internet, can't you? Your phone. Well, we need a network in the church that can handle diversity. As long as you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and you set your foundational belief, what else matters? Why? It doesn't mean that you can't be different. Some people like a PC and some like a Mac. But it doesn't mean they can't collaborate and work together. That's what we're going to have to find in the church. It does not rely on a single hub or node. In other words, the way the Internet works is originally was, was the ARPANET is what it's called for advanced research. And what it was is a bunch of computers networked together. And if you take any one of those computers out of service, nothing happens. It simply reroutes the messages. So in the last days, we're going to have a network. And that network is such that if any one of us gets taken out, the network continues. Let's just say that you start uh, a healing, uh, the healing ministry. And you're out there uh, praying for the sick. And all of a sudden, they throw you in jail for practicing medicine without a license. But if you have trained some people, they can go forth and keep going, right? And that's the whole idea of the network. It's not dependent upon one person. Can grow and reproduce autonomously. If I, um, I get a business and I connect it to the Internet, and I have like 10 computers, are those 10 computers now a part of the Internet? They are, aren't they? Every one of them can be talked to directly on the Internet, can't they? They can talk out and they can receive back. So you can grow a network just by connecting to it and growing it. And it doesn't just grow your individual business. It now grows the network. Every church ought to be doing this. So is this the way your church is operating? If not, that's okay because you need to do this. You know people. Come together. Come together. Begin to connect. See what God's going to do. Get to know people. And that's one of our goals here is just to be a connector. We're not a church. We're, an in, we're a ministry. Uh, because apparently you can only be a member of one church body for some reason. <laughs> but you can be a member of a lot of ministries. So there's nothing wrong with the local church. But understand that's not going to get you there. Yes, it can help you, but you need to reach out and you need to begin to form your own network out there. Because this is what the last day's church is going to look like. Does your church follow this model? Why do we need a network church? Well, to spread the gospel, right? 
All authority has been given him to go and make disciples. Notice I go is an important word to me. The church has left the building, as Johnny Taylor says. That we're to go. It's not, well, we're going to let them come to us. No, we're out there. So our network is reaching out and can touch anybody. So we should be going out. Teaching them, observe all I commanded you. And Genesis talks about the model, be fruitful and multiply. That it's sheep multiply. Sheep multiply sheep. Sheep beget sheep. Shepherds don't beget sheep. It's up to us to go out and do this work. We need a network to spread the gospel. Just like the internet changed business, there's no reason that we can't build a network that's going to change the world the same way the internet did. Prepare the body of Christ. In the last days, we're going to see tribul tribulation and perilous times. And there's going to also be a great harvest. It says there's a great multitude clothed in white robes that are coming out of the tribulation. So it says two things are going to be happening these last days. Tribulation and harvest. I believe they come together, don't you? Can you see it? That that's what's ripening the harvest? Now, because you understand, he didn't say pray for the harvest. What did he say? Pray for the laborers. We need to endure and overcome threats and hardship. When hard times do come, a network is what's going to protect you. Because if you're reaching out and you're in contact with everybody else, when one gets hit, the other ones can come around them. As Nehemiah said, the work is great and extensive. We are separated far from one another. So whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally there. And our God will fight for us. We need to follow that model. And the network is the way to do it. And Leviticus. If five can chase a hundred, and a hundred chases ten thousand. Now, have you done the math on that? Because if, if five can chase a hundred then a hundred should be chasing about two thousand. It's exponential. So you, can you see when, when they said, if they become one and their language becomes one, nothing will be impossible to them. Remember what he said? And you wonder why we don't have power in the church? Can you see it? We need to develop unity. I believe this is the key to unity is a network model. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and thou in me. We've been so focused on the, the, the hireling gospel of getting people into the kingdom. But we haven't. By, by getting them saved and getting God inside of them. But we're not getting them into God. That's where we become one. And that's the other part of this. That when we're in Him, we become one. And that's what I believe this is the model that He's going to use to do it. In Ephesians, I believe this is what a five-fold ministry is for. We're to equip the saints... For the work of service and the building up of the body of Christ. That's the network church. And that's what we should be doing. Until we all attain the unity of the faith. How are we doing on that? Do you see why we need the fivefold ministry? Because that's what the fivefold ministry is going to do. It's going to build this network. And we're going to find people that have fivefold ministries. If you're a fivefold pastor for instance. Who's your church? How about anybody? Anybody the Lord brings you. Not just your flock. It's his flock that now becomes important. So a five-fold one focuses on the kingdom. Not just on a local body. Are they involved in a local body? Oh, absolutely they are. But that's the key to the, the ministers we have here. We have some pastors and, you know, O.J. has his own church. But OJ, we'll see O.J. a lot of places besides that. Because he takes care of his church, but he's also connected to the body. Because he's operating in the fivefold. He's not just building a single fold ministry. He's out there connecting the body together. So what must I do? Well, number one, you need to become a communication hub in the body of Christ. Who do you know? 
And are you connecting people together? Are you knitting this one to this one to this one to this one? Do you know who they are? Have you gone to all these other meetings and found out what they're doing and started connecting people together? We have some here. That's what we all should be doing. We should be connecting and see, because you see, the body's supposed to flow. If this person's got this kind of a gift and they're all stacked up over here, but they're needed over here, why don't we just flow? I mean, why do we have to own little portions of the body? Let's let them flow in the kingdom. And we need to be doing that. So we need to become a communication hub. But you understand, if you're a hub, then you've got little people that you're connected to. And to you, you're in the center of the hub. But this point out here that's on the outside of your hub, guess what? They're a hub too. And they're the center of their hub. And that's what makes a network. Everybody's a hub. And you should always, every one of you should be a hub. I believe if you look at the body, you'll find the neural system works that way. And that's what the, we're supposed to be as a body. Number two, connect yourself to a larger network outside your local church. There are networks out there. There's people already connecting together. Go find them. If you can't find a network, talk to prayer people. They're the best network people I've seen. They've, they've definitely beat everybody else as far as networks go. But I believe the apostolic is coming forth. I believe the prophets are coming. And I believe that the fivefold is coming and we're going to be connected together. So go out and find a network. And then prepare yourself and those you love for the things that are coming. We know these things are coming. How many, how many are actually preparing for the things that they know are coming? There's preachers out there that are preaching the revelation and the end times and what's going to happen. I know because I started to go around to some of the churches and I said, so what are you doing to prepare the people for when this happens? And I, I'm getting silence. So I, we need to be preparing for the things that are coming. You, you need to be connected to someone who will not let you miss your destiny, even if it's to die on a cross. And that's the kind of body that we need to have. We need to be ready. We should know what's coming. He's telling us. He said, see, I've told you ahead of time. Why? So we could be ready and prepared. Are we getting ready and prepared? What are the two things we need to be ready and prepared for? What do you think the two are? Number one, tribulation, right? And number two, the harvest. They're going to come together. Are we prepared? What if, uh, what if there is a, a major revival? Have we got enough people to handle it? I mean, have we prepared the, the workers or the laborers for the harvest? Are we ready for the tribulation of things that could happen? I mean, God forbid the, the water system went out downtown. And the CDC shut down and a whole bunch of other things shut down. I'm thinking, what? I mean, that's, uh, that's tribulation. The, if the power grid goes out for a week, are you going to be able to to come together and function as a body? Are we preparing to continue to operate? Because that's the time when the harvest is going to come in, when these things hit. And we need to be ready to minister during that time. How do you tell? Like I said, we may, you're either going to make a name for yourself or you're going to let the Lord make you great and build His kingdom. And I just want to finish with a quick prophecy. Now I'll just read it this time. This is a prophecy that he gave me. And when I do my teachings, I usually get them out of a prophecy, by the way. And the word he gave me was the voice of many waters. He said, I am building my harvest network that will bring revelation and power. Not just it, it, revelation and power are going to flow through this network to those that I'm calling forth. This revelation network is a way to communicate my truth and my direction to many believers throughout my body and throughout the world. This network will strengthen and unify my body so that my words can flow directly, clearly, and timely. For my voice in these days will be like the voice of many waters flowing from my throne. It is my words that will bring my body together, giving her shape, purpose, and power. This network will reveal my order and my leadership. We're going to see the leadership come out of this network, true leadership. The network will communicate my truth and revelation to bring peace and direction when the world is broadcasting fear and confusion. Is it happening now? 
This network will carry my words and my power. Today, I'm calling you to build my network by sharing my word and helping one another. My words and my callings will go forth across the network and will flow to individuals and the bodies of believers who will receive them and take action. Be a conduit of revelation and resources to equip them and support them. Be a joint in my body that holds the dry bones together. As I bring the dry bones together into a nourished, unified body, be a hub of my revelation network and even a source in the power grid. So that's the word he gave me that this message came out of. And I believe it's happening. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you're going to bring forth this, this network, Lord, that you're going to knit us together. And, Lord, we just want to reach out and see who it is, Lord, and whoever it is or whatever it is that you want to join us to, we want you to do it, Lord. And, Lord, if there's things that we're joined to that we're not supposed to be, we ask you to break them free so that we can flow freely in your body and be a part of what you've called us to be, Lord. Lord, let this be a hub and let each one here be a hub of this network. And let us reach out across, the, across this state, across this nation, and across this world, even from this space, Lord, that every single node is connected all the way. And I thank you, Lord. If there's other networks out there, Lord, that we need to join, then show us which ones to do it. But I thank you that each person here tonight, in the next just few weeks, is going to be fully connected, Lord, into the network which spans your entire earth and builds your kingdom that we may be your bride, ready and able, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.